Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I come from a family of drinkers. In some sense, drinking was our family sport. Drinking was like the glue that held us together as a family. So it's not really surprising that I started drinking when I was 13. I grew up in Asheville, and Asheville's, as some of you know, not the town it was in 1963. 1963, there was a convenience store just off Haywood Avenue, about a block from Pritchard Park, and they would sell anything to anyone. In high school, I played football on Friday night, and after the game was over, I'd go and drink with my friends. Now, I'm a lifelong Episcopalian, therefore I'm a polite drinker. <laughs> no DUIs, no falling down at parties, no embarrassing scenes, never had a wreck, never missed a day of work. As I grew older, I would drink late at night. I drink when my wife and my kids went to bed. And so it was just me and Jack Daniels in the dark. When I started the process of discernment to the priesthood, part of that process was to see a psychologist. Amid all those questions that the psychologist asked me, she asked me about my drinking, and when I told her the truth, she said, you have to see an alcohol specialist. And I almost said to her, I am an alcohol specialist, <laughs> but I did not. So I went to see a woman named Kitty Myatt in Nashville. And one of her questions was, when's the last time you had any alcohol to drink? And I said, about 20 minutes ago, because I had stopped at the Jim Dandy convenience store on my way to see her. And she looked at me and there was this long pause and she said, you have to quit drinking. And I said, okay, for how long? And she said, forever. And hearing that word forever was like a death knell. I couldn't imagine how I was going to survive without alcohol. I couldn't imagine what me and my family would actually do together. I couldn't imagine how I was ever gonna to get to sleep and on and on and on. So I went home and told Joe, my wife, and we went through the house and we poured out all the beer and the wine and the Jack Daniels down the drain. I went to my favorite hiding place in the linen closet and got out all these bottles and we poured those down the drain. The first week I was really surprisingly okay. I ate tons of sugar. I read a, read a lot of late books at night. Now, along with this, sort of parallel to this, I was in the process in the Diocese of Tennessee, or as we say, Tennessee, to be a priest. So I had gone through the process and I was just waiting to hear from the bishop. And about 10, year, uh, 10 years, it felt like 10 years, after 10 days after seeing Kitty Myatt, I got a letter from the diocese. I was standing in our front yard, 2113 19th Avenue South, and I opened the envelope. And I read the first words and it said, I am pleased to accept you as a postulate. Immediately I wondered, could I be a good enough person to actually become a priest? Because if you were a recovering alcoholic, you were still an alcoholic. And I stood in the front yard immobilized, wondering, what if I started drinking again? What if I became an embarrassment to the church? And as I stood there, I heard this voice 
inside me. To this day, I don't know what it was. I think it was the Holy Spirit. And it said to me, remember, you are more than this. Remember, you are more than this. This was my old life. This was how I had seen myself and seen other people. And to be more than this was to be free to live a new life with a new purpose. To be more than this meant that I was finally free from this addiction and I did not belong to alcohol, I belonged to God. Now, I don't intend this to be an AA meeting, but when we hear St. Paul talking about seeking things that are above and clothing ourselves with a new self, I think what he means for all of us is we are more than our old this. It means we can be born again. We can start over. Not because of our abilities, not because of our conviction, our determination, but because of God's never-ending and limitless love for us. That never-ending, limitless love raises us to new life. The reason I stopped drinking was because God gave me a vision of what my life could be. And I yearned to live into that vision, regardless of what it might take. I had a glimpse of what was beyond this. In the epistle today, Paul is talking about individual behavior, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language. We might talk about senseless shooting in American streets. That's the this that impedes our growth. He is not just talking about individual behavior. He's talking about a corporate behavior as well. We as Christians are to model for the world what it looks like to live a Christ-like life. Because God's intention is for this world to be changed. For this world to be more than this. When I wrote this sermon, I wrote that I hadn't gotten over Robert Mueller's hearing. Not because of sort of the content, but because of the whole tone of the proceedings. Because it was so painful to see how our elected leaders treat one another and more how they treat someone who's given his life to serve his country. But today I can't stop thinking about Dayton. I can't stop thinking about just the rancor, the division, the senseless violence that is degrading our country. That is this that is what Paul calls the things that are below. I want to be proud of our leaders. I want to be proud of our country. I want our leaders to be the best examples of who we're supposed to be for all people. I yearn for all of us to live up to our calling, but here's the thing. I can't do anything about the people in Congress. I can do something about myself. It's a fool's errand to spend our lives complaining about those other people because it just feeds our egos. It just makes us self-righteous. So what is it that we can actually do? St. Paul tells us, set your mind on things that are above. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly, passion, evil, desire, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language. Think about what our Congress would be like if they put those things away. Instead, 
Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Be the change you seek in the world. As Christians, we are to be living reminders of what God wants for all of God's children. I feel with all my heart that we as a nation are to be more than this. But that movement will not happen if we stay filled with anger, malice, slander, and abusive language from our mouths. We are living the one life we have to live, and we are called to live that life for God. Our task is to live this life, and God's task is to take care of the rest. It doesn't mean we're not political. It means that we have an obligation to be involved citizens, but we offer ourselves up for God's work of making the world right of God's work of bringing in the realm of peace and justice and mercy here on earth as it is in heaven. We are to incarnate compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. And it's not that hard. Remember to kill a mockingbird? Remember to be So, you know, at the, at the center of the novel, there's a group of, of white men who, who are in a mob who've, who've gathered around a black man's house and accused him of a crime he didn't commit. On the very edge of the crowd is a small girl named Scout, who's Atticus Finch's daughter. And just as the mob is getting ready to do something horrible, she yells to one of the men. And she says, hey, Mr. Cunningham, don't you remember me? I go to school with your son, Walter. We brought him home from dinner one time. Will you tell him, hey, for me? In that moment, Walter's father, Mr. Cunningham, remembers he is more than this. And he separates himself from the mob and he squats down face to face with Scout, the little girl. And he says to her, I'll tell him you said, hey, little lady. And because of that, the mob remembers they're all more than this, and they disperse. If we want our leaders to behave better, let's begin with ourselves. Let's remind ourselves we are more than this. And then let's speak to that world, to that world in word and in deed because we are Christ bearers, we are God's beloved, we are citizens of the new Jerusalem. All of us, Republicans and Democrats, alcoholics, all of us in centers of God's need, of God's redemption, all of us are men and women who have lost our way and forget who we are and need to be reminded, reminded by the voice of a small girl Reminded by people like us, reminded by a voice that comes to us as we're standing in our front yard. We're on this journey to be more than this, and therefore our calling is to embrace who we are and to remind one another of who we are so that through us, God might make the world new. Amen.